Hello, everyone, and welcome to Palladium Magazine's Digital Salon with Sam Oburia. I'm Wolf Tyvey, Editor-in-Chief of Palladium. I'm joined, as usual, by Ash Milton, our Managing Editor. Hey, everyone. Nice to see you again. Thanks, Ash. Our guest today is Sam Oburia. In 2017, Samo founded Bismarck Analysis, a consulting firm that investigates the political and institutional landscape of society. He also studies how institutions endure as a research fellow at the Long Now Foundation and how institutions can shape the future of technology as a senior research fellow in political science at the Foresight Institute. Hi, Samo. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for coming on. So as usual, we're joined by our live audience of Palladium members and friends. This conversation will be recorded and rebroadcast on YouTube and as a podcast. To become a Palladium member and get invited to upcoming salons, please visit palladiummag.com slash subscribe. The plan is for Ash, Samo, and I, me, to have a discussion for about half an hour and then move to questions with our live audience. Please be sure to use the Q&A function in Zoom to post your questions. So let's start with an overview of great founder theory, Samo. You've developed what you're calling great founder theory, which proposes that fa great founders impact the world through the institutions they create, particularly those which outlast them. These institutions carry civilization's knowledge, organization, and social technologies. When they decay, so does so society at large. Um, how does great founder theory compare to other narratives and challenge those other narratives like great man theory or, or sort of more structural theories like institutionalism. Yeah, in particular, I think what is often missed by some of the more structuralist theories is a sense of human choice and construction. Often it's said that, you know, um, various things of part, they're part of everyday lives are social constructs. I think this is completely true, right? They are social constructs. Uh, just as my home is a physical construct, you might necessarily, you, know, you don't necessarily want to deconstruct all your physical constructs and you don't want to deconstruct all your social constructs. But yes, fundamentally, the house is kind of arbitrary, as is like, you know, things like having a job or participating in an organized religion or being a citizen of a state. Now, what... what drives these social technologies forward, I think a lot of people imagine that this stuff is super overdetermined. I would say that there is a scarcity of innovation in social technology. So I think it's a significant bottleneck in a big historical and civilizational event when someone introduces a new social technology, such as a new functional code of laws or a different form of organized religion or a new way to organize militaries and so on. So essentially, I think that this is innovation bottlenecked. I think this innovation necessarily comes from individuals and small groups. Now, while these individuals and small groups are themselves socially determined, it can be extremely difficult to work out what the psychological consequences of living in a certain society are. So even though in a way I'm kind of determinist, I think it's extremely difficult to predict how a creative individual is going to deterministically result from a particular society. And since it's a very stochastic event, since it's not necessary that such an individual happens to come into play, such a prophet or general or statesman or entrepreneur or technologist, it's you know very hard to predict what happens. So I think that it's very useful to have a theory that takes as a given this individual is relatively unconstrained, modulo knowledge, you can't necessarily predict which knowledge they will or won't have. Uh, you can predict that they'll be pursuing some objectives, right? So I think that a lot of these social determinist theories would propose that actually, like the biggest determinants are these invariants, like large population centers or material technology, right? The absence or presence of things like steam engines and so on. But if it actually hinges on these individuals, these unusual individuals, these small groups of people, I think then uh, that type of prediction just doesn't hold. And all we can do is this other type of prediction where we just, you know, take the founders granted, we can analyze what they're doing, we can analyze how difficult or easy it is for them to intervene on society. But like as to their objectives, their goals, it's, it's often very idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. think of this as an individualistic theory? Um, it really depends what you mean by individualistic. I, I suppose that the individual matters more than um, the, the contexts around them. So perhaps we think of individuals as primarily shaping rather than being shaped by 
their social context? Well, I think that a few individuals shape their social context far more than others, right? So I think that there are some exceptional individuals that shape society. Um, and here is perhaps the nuance that distinguishes this from um, great man theory as such. Great man theory proposes that you shape society by participating in grand events, right? It might focus mm -hmm. on a general's victory on the battlefield. I wouldn't focus on the general's victory on the battlefield at all, unless in the aftermath of the battle, the great founder is killed. No, I'd focus on the military reforms, right? So for example, if we look at Napoleon, I perhaps would acknowledge that his skill at winning battles is extremely important, but his enduring contribution to society and civilization would be something like the organization of a national conscription system, the precise way the you know central command sort of functioned, right? The battlefield command, where he often delegated decisions to his underlings, influencing later things like the Prussian system. Uh, the Napoleonic code of law was extended and spread across all over Europe, often kept even after Napoleonic forces were kicked out. And finally, he engaged in a massive amount of myth-making, right? He revived this cult of Alexander and Caesar. If you read 19th mm -hmm. century literature, the man of destiny that shapes history, that shakes history, was Napoleon. And this mm -hmm. archetype, like, shaped European thinking and European statesmanship, everything from, like, you know, Nietzsche's commentary on it, Hegel's commentary on it, so the, on the philosophy side, and then also on the statecraft side, uh, at least Napoleon III tried to imitate him, and arguably, mm -hmm. less successfully, many 20th century leaders uh, sought to imitate Napoleon right. and uh, imitate his jump from military success to political control. So you, uh, you've characterized... So him being as, a, as an archetype, I think he, yeah. he also has a founder-like role there. Interesting. So you, uh, just earlier, you characterized this as like an innovation bottlenecked problem, but, yes. but it's not just innovation, is it? It's also reviving or rebuilding uh, institutionally embodied social technology. It's not like the social technology sticks around without the institution. No, it has to be it go. embodied. It has to be embodied in a community of practice. This community can be like, you know, highly bureaucratized the way arguably parts of the Catholic Church have been, right? With the legal system and like these clear divisions mm -hmm. of responsibilities mm -hmm. and roles. It can be less like embodied. It can be more like this practice where, you know, say, uh, a particular tribe might have a festival uh, somewhere out there next to a lake or in the desert once every year. Um, you know, this is certainly something that can persist in a distributed manner, but is created in this very, like, I almost want to say centralized manner. They're mm -hmm. not presupposing that the innovator is at the center of society, right? They might actually be at the fringes of society. If right. you look at something like uh, the creation of the Mormon religion by Joseph Smith, he doesn't start off at the center of American society, but he creates mm. a new center around himself and so on. It sounds like you've in part at least created here a theory of history. It um, is a theory I'm of wondering history. why then do you think it's important to have a theory of history? Well, to conclude just an earlier thought, I do want to say the founders are always working with the raw materials available to them, right? So there are building up on whatever surrounds them and they are somewhat constrained as to what they can achieve in a lifetime. I think, however, you can achieve quite a bit, and I think there have been significant jumps in civilizational complexity uh, driven by founders, right? The sort of thing where you might have a transition where in two generations or in a single generation, you have a nomadic people become a settled people, right? Or build a grand city larger than has any ever existed before with all the intricacies in it. Um, or, you know, transition to an industrial society. But to answer your question, why is it important to have a theory of history? It's several reasons. Like, first off, I think it's good to understand the social world. I think stories about how the social world works, ideologies around it, can be more or less accurate. People would direct their efforts and evaluate the legitimacy or illegitimacy of pro-social efforts to try to build up civilization through the framework they believe in. You know, there's a classical note during the French Revolution, you know, the Republic has no need of savants. When speaking of uh, people like Laplace and other mathematicians and scientists, if the belief is the Republic has no need of statesmen and statesmen are persecuted, then the Republic's revolution fares poorly, let alone the Republic's evolution to whatever it might be trying to achieve that replaces the ancien regime. So I think that in societies where we don't understand the role of uh, founders, 
we have a confused relation to our heroes where you know the confusion can go either way it can be deeds focused which is perhaps useful it's useful to commemorate those who participate in great events um, but I think it's it's much more important to to look at the origin of social order, to look at the Moseses and Lycurguses of the world that set up particular social systems, and to understand what they look like, right? Um, mm -hmm. So because, the, the the idea there is is that you almost need these archetypes kind of floating around in society that uh, can legitimize certain types of constructive action. Yeah, I think the constructive action will often seem illegitimate because if you are bypassing uh, dead institutions, institutions that are dead players, that are dysfunctional, uh, they obviously won't like this very much, right? And they won't like the sort of circumvention that's necessary to construct something new. Um, you might be trying to bypass something like a political monopoly, right? Or you might be trying to bypass something like an economic monopoly. Mm -hmm. And then... Just to say one, one or two things more about why theories of history matter, I think everyone is always acting on an implicit theory of history. Everyone right. believes it. Like if you talk to anyone in Silicon Valley right now, why do you think what you do matters at all? They'll say, well, technology drives history, right? Or they'll say, well, I want to contribute to human progress or I want to advance technology and this is the most important thing in the world. In that statement, embedded in those statements is an assumption of technological determinism, right? Mm -hmm. And that technological progress necessarily improves human lives and the technological progress is kind of unstoppable and desirable yet it's important for us to participate in it that an individual can accelerate it or decelerate it but if you start talking to them about questions well how would you evaluate the speed of technological progress is this the right way to accelerate it uh, they usually run out of material but that basic believed theory is there and mm -hmm. arguably we all have these right um i think for many people uh, they might see a history as history as a play of like you know patriots and tyrants this would be in sort of this kind of american constitutionalist mindset um or you might see it as you know this sort of like moral uh, reformation or dereformation right you would have saints and sinners and they can shape the society or you might think people have no role at all individuals have no role at all and it's mm -hmm. all predetermined and it's the technology that's moving us but I would claim like any individual that's acting on the world must have on some level a belief that they are affecting the world and that counterfactually like, you know, it matters whether or not they're at home mm -hmm. playing video games or, you know, at home coding or leave the home to win a battle. There's like some sort of implicit belief that it matters, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting that you're talking about implicit theories of history here. Um, you know, as you probably know, we had a piece just mm -hmm. this week at Palladium on Xi Jinping and his more explicit theory of history. It's it's also the case that in the world, right, a lot of the major theories about how history works originate from, from Europe and from the Western world. And yet, despite that, um, Western institutions, and particularly America, definitely don't seem to have an explicit model of how history works anymore. Do you think that this is a serious problem in some way? And how would you get back to having an explicit model of history rather than just an implicit one? Well, I'm going to note here that China is a Marxist-derived society, and Marxism is one of the better demonstrations of the coordinating power. So any theory of history can, in fact, serve as the basis of an ideology, right? And the more correct this theory of history is, the more powerful the adherents of the ideology are. So, for example, a Marxist ideology might actually describe fairly well what you need to do in order to industrialize while interacting with the market system. It might uh, propose things such as the need to maintain industrial sovereignty, the need to focus on heavy industry and so on, but it might get other things wrong. Uh, let's remember that you know, no matter how wastefully inefficient the Soviet Union was, at the end of the day, it could deliver many thousands of tanks to the, to the battle lines of Eastern Europe. Right? These are incredible feats of coordination, incredible feats of planning. I can even make this um, more visceral. Consider something like D-Day, right? If large-scale, society-scale planning is not ever possible, how in the world did D-Day happen? Right? It obviously did happen. Therefore, mm -hmm. at least sometimes society-wide planning is possible. So you might get these gems of accuracy that enable correct policy or enable constructive action, or you might have destructive things that lead to the destruction of action. For example, if you only have 
a class-based analysis of the role of military officers rather than track the ideology of military officers, which is often you know, centered on protection of the homeland, whatever the homeland itself is. It doesn't matter if it's czarist or communist. You might end up being a loyal officer to whichever regime. But if you analyze an officer through sort of a Marxist lens, you might come to the conclusion that, oh, necessarily, because of their background, they're going to have reactionary beliefs, and therefore it's important to purge them. And you know, arguably, that was a big problem for Stalin. So the explicit ideology of the Soviet Union is very close to the basis of current Chinese ideology. It's mm -hmm. good to remember that the Sino-Soviet split between Khrushchev and Mao was over Khrushchev denouncing Stalin. Mao emphatically believed this was revisionism, right? That you should mm -hmm. not denounce Stalin, right? So Stalin is, in a way, directly uh, part of this intellectual legacy. So when we look at Xi's decisions today, if you analyze them through like this deeply like kind of post-Stalinist lens, it makes a lot of sense. And not only is there a believed explicit ideology by Xi, the explicit ideology is used as a method to coordinate the Chinese Communist Party. People are expected to be well-versed in this. Again, the comparison I would invite quite naturally between the Chinese Communist Party and the Catholic Church. Arguably, in some aspects, they both govern about a billion people. They both have a catechism. They used to also, you know, both have the equivalent of the Inquisition. They had theoretically a central decision maker and so on. Now, this analogy only goes so far. Um, there are important differences, right? The important difference, first off, is control of a nation state. Secondly, a different belief about the course of history. You can't just plug in one ideology for the other and expect the organizations to work just as well. Uh, the Marxist vision of the future is a globalizing future. It's a technologically advanced future. In theory, it's also a materially abundant future, but it's a future achieved through class struggle. So it's fundamentally adversarial. So this fundamental assumption of adversariality leads to fundamentally like, you know, adversarial responses to social mm -hmm. challenges. So in the West, I we also have adversarial ideology of a different type, right? right? Like say, um, the idea of like, you know, free market competition is pretty adversarial, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, a bit more closer to home and, and related to that is the Silicon Valley archetype of the founder, which almost seems like, a, you know, in some way, it's a socially constructed mythology of of someone founding uh, mm -hmm. a disruptive startup that roots around kind of sclerotic economic institutions uh, to, to create some value and this it's this theory it's a theory of history that legitimizes a certain form of action and, yes. and motivates a certain form of action yes. so it's very much in line with, with what you've been saying well if they didn't believe in founders there would be fewer companies <laughs> right there would also be like you know the PR would be different I think something like about 80% of the company would exist in a Silicon Valley that didn't believe in founders mm -hmm. but the 20% that wouldn't exist are the most interesting ones. There's the counterfactually most interesting ones. So I think we have to judge, you know, this idea of founders if we analyze it as a social technology on the basis of these, you know, these things that might not have happened, these things that were not overdetermined. Mm -hmm. So in institutions, slightly different track, there's this idea of knowledge embedded in those institutions, some of which we can't see. And you've defined mm -hmm. intellectual dark matter as the knowledge we can't see publicly, but whose existence we can infer because the institution wouldn't work without it. Um, so what, what are good examples of intellectual dark matter in, in present society? Are there mm -hmm. key traditions of knowledge that are at risk uh, of, of failing to be passed down and being lost? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, intellectual dark matter is much like physical dark matter, right? Like where you have the galaxies that must be much more massive than we, we can infer from the stuff that's visible with normal light, right? Like so the galaxies mm -hmm. are, are spinning so fast it would spin apart. In the physical world, it's possible we like just don't understand gravity well enough. Maybe an alternative theory of gravity will reveal that the dark matter is just an illusion. Uh, however, the principle rests. It's stuff we can show that exists, just as you know, you helpfully summarized uh, some of my thinking there. So what are the types of dark matter? I think it's at least you know, national security, state technological secrets. From the perspective of the Soviet Union, the atomic bomb in 1946 is intellectual dark matter. Second, uh, you know, trade secrets. 
like many of the details of how, say, a particular microchip might be constructed today are such dark matter. Further, uh, what is the generating, you know, what are the basic principles and tricks that a very, very good Fields winning medalist mathematician might use to come to some of his or her strongest results? Those are things that the mathematician perhaps could put into words, but might choose not to, right? So it's not quite a trade secret, it's a personal secret, but some of them are things he could never, he or she could never put into words, right? So that's where we get to the like implicit tacit knowledge. And it might be, you know, uh, intellectually implicit, you know, stuff that you might just perceive. It might be physically implicit, such as, you know, a surgeon uh, moving through the human body with a scalpel. Uh, the numbers are quite clear. You should definitely research how good your surgeon is. It's one of the most variable tasks we accept in the modern world as primarily the result of individual skill, literally a matter of life and death. And the numbers, again, are very clear, like these are order of magnitude differences, right, between an uh, extremely good surgeon and a mediocre surgeon, and seems to be very difficult to get the extraordinary surgeons. Uh, this is why I sometimes see very old surgeons, even though you might assume as age goes, the shaking of the hand would be more important than the knowledge, but it seems for a long time, the implicit knowledge is more important than the tremors. Um, to move further on this, it's, you know, well, let's, let's look at a number of things. I think a lot of our social technology is sort of running on fumes. Uh, a lot of the established high trust nature of our society was built in a very, very different era in very, very different socioeconomic conditions. For the United States in particular, I think the massive expansion of both wealth and population from 1950 to 1970 caused a number of institutions to assume this pattern of growth that's essentially a pyramid scheme it's, that's unsustainable. One of these would be probably uh, academia and the economics around grad students. But the small, the small details matter so much, it's sort of like, um, in particular, I think there's a certain kind of personability that millennials probably don't have having grown up in an economically and socially primarily zero-sum world rather than a very positive-sum world like the one the baby boomers grew up in. So usually we critique the baby boomers and you know we know how unfair the world is for the millennials, but I sort of feel the millennials often just like actually lack some of the basic human interpersonal skills that uh, the boomers have, right? Like, you know, the millennial might find it frustrating that they have to teach the baby boomer how to use Excel but they never ask themselves, so how exactly does the baby boomer manage to man maneuver in the workplace so that they never need to learn any of these new tools? They just know how to move the millennials around, right? And I think part of it is seniority and privilege, sure, but part of it is just legitimate skill at management of humans and, you know, everything from team building to, uh, to judging individual psychology. Much more strongly, though, and critically, the practice of science is significantly endangered. Possibly the best way to you know think of academics is that they're catalog they're they're producing a catalog of human knowledge, and I think that through the course of this training that proceeds through homework and practice, never is there any sort of training or practice in what research would look like at the edge of a field before knowledge has fully crystallized. I think in the uh, in the 18th and 19th century, this kind of science was primarily practiced by a few privileged individuals. Right, people who could support themselves economically, had enough social stability and support that they didn't need to prove themselves to anyone. In other words, they started off with tenure when they were 20, not crawled their way to tenure at 50 or 60 over you know, 99 other grad students that never made it. No, no, it was just like, you're here, you have this privilege, noblesse oblige commands that you use it. If you don't use it, you're a disgrace. At least you know, go, go be a, a military officer somewhere. But it for makes some me think. Sorry, for some reason, saying, it was acceptable to become a naturalist, like a natural philosopher. And I think they did quite a bit. It makes me think of you know right now um, the Ivy League universities, universities around the world are talking about flipping to Zoom for classes in the fall. Mm -hmm. And given that we're talking about intellectual dark matter at elite institutions, especially. It sounds like if we assume this, you know, that people go to these kinds of elite universities in part to associate with elites and elite institutions and learn uh, these kinds of skills that can't just be made legible in a textbook. Um, 
If it becomes normalized that most people are experiencing the Ivy League universities through Zoom, uh, is there still a point in going? It, it seems like this will kind of collapse <laughs> in part what they're trying to do. Well, I think the question is to what extent has it already collapsed before Zoom made it apparent, right? Like the mm. biggest critique one can make of Skull and Bones today is that not much plotting happens there. Like arguably the entire point mm. of Skull and Bones at elite, elite University is to produce elite conspiracies. You know, I know elite conspiracy production seems to be falling rapidly. So if we had like a national conspiracy index, the national conspiracy index is super low right now. It's high in China. It's high in Russia. We can't allow a conspiracy gap, you know. Um, now, yeah. I'm not saying we should make more Epsteins. But, you know, some someone must do the function of coordinating, right? And informal coordination is what you do at the institutional frontier. When you encounter mm. new problems that the previous bureaucracies weren't programmed for, if we're perpetually stuck running the FBI of the 1960s, and this was our only law enforcement agency, we would be in a lot of trouble. New there's a problem that have happens to be created in, to, to fill gaps. Yeah, yeah. There's a problem that happens in conspiracies where um, you, I, you know, I call this losing the joke. Uh, you can have a public frame, mm -hmm. but if you fail to sort of inculcate your successors, uh, then they will essentially just believe the public frame without understanding why it existed. I think something like this kind of happened with neoconservatism, uh, you know, between the original generation and the Iraq war generation. Mm -hmm. It seems like, you know, you can't explain a conspiracy over Zoom. Uh, maybe there are no longer good conspiracies in the world. If there are any, they might not survive this. Well, I think that, you know, I think that that's super interesting. I think that writing can be critiqued in the same way. Yet Leo Strauss would propose that you can, in fact, communicate between the lines over writing, and arguably much of the same can be done by a video. So I think there are some there are some methods to like say things without saying them and so on, and this can provide differential advantage. And, um, but like again, what I would propose is that the Harvard experience has already been so bureaucratized that it was not a good sandbox for people to truly learn leadership. I think at this point, it's primarily this sort of like, you know, it grants you a minor patent of nobility. So other organizations hire, you know, a Harvard person because they never, you know, no one ever get got fired for hiring someone from Harvard. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think actually my my answer is I don't expect a critical shortfall of leadership because I believe no critical leadership skills were taught. Hmm. You but that's, that's a article, pessimistic view. That's a pessimistic view. Yeah. You have an article that's sort of relevant to this, uh, a, a viral article, Live versus Dead Players, mm -hmm. that you wrote some time ago. And, you know, to explain this distinction, a live player is someone who can do new things, who acts outside of just the pre-existing norms that they are in. Mm -hmm. A dead player is not capable of this. They basically only work according to the scripts that they are surrounded by or that the institutions they're in have. Um, it sounds like you don't think there are very many live players in our institutions. I'm interested in why you think that is. Well, I think uh, performance is, uh, you know, performance is very strong indicator here. How many institutions have in an agile way adapted to the shock of the coronavirus, the COVID-19? Very few, very, very few. Um, how many of these institutions are having an easy time navigating the economic fallout. That's a consequence. Again, very few. How many of our media institutions or political institutions adapted to the last few years of unusual politics? Again, very few, right? So when I look at uh, government and the large economic bodies, they don't display this behavior. If there are live players within them, well, they're not piloting the institutions in question, right? And their range, right. the range of their adaptability, what it can do for us is extremely limited. So in a way, the effective intelligence of the organizations has gone massively dumb, a down. They've become these dumb, lumbering giants that can't see reality, but repeat these things over and over again that they used to do. Even worse, if you have essentially normal careerists filter up through a bureaucracy, the natural course of the wiring of an organization, its sensors, is that the wires rot away Everyone always wants to report good news. So unless there's a countervailing force, at the end of the day, if there's a control room, all the panels have green lights because the lights are broken, right? Not because everything is fine. 
And right now, if you look at the stock market, how much of our society is used to looking at the dashboard of the stock market to figure out if things are fine? Like a significant number of organizations, you would be insane to look at the stock market and decide that it's actually all fine. The only way you can justify it is like an excessive belief in the efficient market hypothesis. But I think this is overbearing and overbelieving in the information system that was set up for a very specific purpose, has been many times modified, has been adulterated through all sorts of strange legal, financial, and governmental mechanisms, right? So we introduced these measures to boost economic productivity, and eventually we lost track of it. We just started looking at these measures instead of the underlying you know, thing. And uh, that, that's why it, it's very easy to have an economy in crisis and have a stock market, that, at least on the surface, you should interpret as a belief that things will return to normal or will be good. Yeah, so, so this is interesting. This is related to the kind of idea that these institutions kind of decay over time and-, and Need active you, repair. Yeah, yeah and, and one of the or aspects re- that redesign. you mentioned- Right, and one of the aspects that you mentioned is actually that there might be live players around, but not actually embedded in controlling positions within the institutions and thus not able to do that repair is is sort of locking out the live players part of the process of decay there well i think it's either eliminating or locking out the live players but also not fostering the creation of enough live players right right like i think we do you know one could argue that the true reigning ideology of the industrial system has always been six sigma where when you encounter, this is a manufacturing ideology, right? This is a manufacturing management method. You find an error, uh, a type of error occurs at the end of the assembly line in your product. It could be a car, it could be a computer, it could be a can of soup. You don't try to figure out what went wrong with that can of soup. What you instead do is you go at every single step of the process in the assembly line and try to reduce variance. Mm -hmm. And then the end result is often your error goes away. So I think what we've done is through every single step from like your childhood environment to your early, you know, early education to your professional career, we've tampered down on the variance. So in a way we have excellent cans of soup, but we don't have like, you know, very good live players because the live players were never built by an assembly line. The the problem of like, you know, the creation of excellent free human beings, that was never industrialized. We know how to make good factory workers. We know how to make good cars. And again, I'm not even saying that this is like immediately achievable. I am saying though that like when we look at something like the Sputnik moment and the Sputnik crisis, right? Where the Mm -hmm. US massively upscaled its production of engineers and technicians on paper, we should be very skeptical whether this resulted in the production of more excellent engineers and scientists or fewer. Because if you're reducing a variance on some problem like educating engineers, Well, you might get a very excellent mediocre engineer, but precisely the measures you use to get to that very excellent mediocre engineer precluded the outliers, right? Precluded the outlier that might have been the inventor or the industrialist or whatever. Yeah, it's it's notable that most of the engineers who kind of did the great things in subsequent decades were trained before that, uh, that uh, basically before the early Cold War. Right, right, right. So... As, as institutions kind of decay and, and society changes, um, occasionally there's these large institutional transitions, uh, sometimes in the form of a revolution. Um, but the degree of actual novelty versus continuity and the actual agents of change there are often not clear on the surface of like who's actually the actor, how much are things actually changing. Um, so I, I'd be curious how you see what is a revolution and, and what do people not understand about how these kind of big institutional turnovers actually work? Well, my, my, view, of, uh, my view of revolution tends to be surprisingly or unsurprisingly Leninist, right? So I tend to think that, uh, yes, any transformation of society is spearheaded by a small fraction of a rising elite organizing resources that were previously not organized to change the balance of power and the balance of coordination between society's existing elites. So what are the consequences of this? For example, I think in a revolution often, a surprising amount of the establishment before the revolution is preserved. It's just reconfigured. Mm -hmm. Examples of this might include, in the modern Japanese uh, diet, their parliament, 
I think about half of parliament members are descended from samurai families. Mm -hmm. How long has it been since 1945? And even before 1945, right, like the Meiji Restoration itself yeah. disempowered the feudal system and installed a bureaucratic system. How is it possible that the samurai family survived both the centralization of the Meiji Restoration, the defeat in World War II, which really shattered the military institutions into which the samurai families had gone, American occupation, and now they're again people from the same families, from the same social circles, are at least half of the people in Japanese parliament. Or to give a different puzzle, why is it that so many of the early Bolsheviks ended up having this like no noble, uh, some noble ancestry, usually from the minor nobility? And again, the same phenomena can be seen in China. And I'm not going to like go into details of the French Revolution, but when the French Revolution was over, the aristocrats that did survive from the Enchian regime often had found a spot in the new regime, whether it be Napoleonic France or the Restoration period. Right. Uh, again, the continuity is even stronger in the American Revolution. In the American Revolution, it's just a few extra people join the business of government. But the main thing that happens is uh, the governments that were already active in the colonies receive independence from the central government in London. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's almost almost, you know, almost better to think of it as a secession rather than a revolution. Right. right. Like the same people are running Massachusetts, the same people are running Boston, the same people are running Virginia on the same basis of power as uh, before and after. Now, Samo, sure. you earlier mentioned the uh, Sino-Soviet split where part of what happened was that uh, Khrushchev had denounced Stalin, forcing this break kind of in the ideological continuity, at least. Uh, in, in Deng's reforms in China, one of the notable aspects was that he essentially, despite having been persecuted by Mao and his inner circle, refused mm -hmm. to denounce him and very explicitly um, framed his project as a continuity of the, you know, the Communist Party's revolution. Mm -hmm. To this day, they have a party line where, you know, the, the history of Communist Party rule has kind of been developing thought, but always unbroken. I'm interested to hear how you interpret that kind of move on the part of leaders who are invoking revolution. Well, it's uh, kind of risky, right? If you propose the revolution is a one-time event, a founding event, you might be stuck with a very narrow set of interpretations for how politics should go, how economics should go. If you propose the revolution is permanent, then you're perhaps not secure in power. Arguably, one of the biggest problems with having a government that is significantly staffed with a revolutionary cadre is that they might wish to continue the revolution, as in the reign of terror, uh, you know, even if the need is to step over your neck. So your fellow revolutionaries, right? The revolution eats its children, right? So you kind of have to tamper down on it if from a pragmatic perspective of self-preservation. On the other hand, if you like valorize it completely in the past, its relevance is lost to new generations. There is a significant victory cult in China where the sort of victory over Japanese imperialists is considered as important an achievement of the Chinese Communist Party as is the overturning of the old class system, right? So the, the kind of desire for continuity, I don't think that's even just a feature of revolutionary regimes. Even reactionary regimes will try to claim the revolution for themselves as a positive good. Uh, this is seen in some of the restoration monarchies in 19th century France, where they adopt and even argue people who are themselves, you know, from the same monarchy, the same royal family that was like, you know, guillotined, essentially, they would say that the revolution was necessary and good. And for example, Vladimir Putin today might suggest that, you know, Stalin's crimes against his people are unconscionable and Stalin's victory over Hitler is, you know, beyond reproach. So he's both condemning an aspect and endorsing, elevating an aspect. The belief being that there is a way in which the presence could be considered a liability, right? Like the presence of unassimilated historical events are ideological ammunition. These events might turn out to be ammunition for a different type of ideology. So unless you can integrate into your history, both, you know, the Gulag system and the defeat over Hitler and have it integrated well into your ruling ideology, 
These are essentially things that make alternative worldviews uh, something that are desirable. So in modern China, I think claiming the mantle of communism and claiming the mantle that we are truly communist likely preserves the optionality for China to eventually start becoming more ideologically expansionary. Currently, it's not. Currently, it just wishes to preserve its own system for itself and have a different system for other countries. My read on the big historical landscape is that eventually they're going to have to transition to a more universalist ideology. And here's the reason. Elites can only properly negotiate international treaties if they understand each other on a deep social level. So in, you know, 18th, 17th century Europe, this might be the sort of Christian, though secularized aristocracy, right? They have common norms, common beliefs. If they go to a dinner party together, they know exactly what are the things that matter. They read the same people. It doesn't matter if you're Russian nobility or French nobility or British nobility or German nobility, right? You probably even speak the same language, right? You're either from a German family or from a French family, you know, no matter if you rule Greece or if you rule Russia, right? Yeah, so, the cosmopolitanism at the top. Exactly, exactly. And it's very similar in the American system, in American ideology. Why does America want there to be democracies all over the world? Well, because then this makes the politicians and the civil servants in the other countries intuitive. You don't have to go into a deep dive to study exactly how France works. You kind of intuit it. When you meet the French president for a photo op, you know exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you meet G for a photo op, it's less clear exactly what you're doing. How are you benefiting right. him? How are you hurting him? The mechanisms are different. Now, again, there is some similarity. He wants good pictures for a newspaper, but he maybe he wants good pictures for a party newspaper or a good quote to put in the party newspaper, something you can say or did not say, right? That's tactically useful for winning or losing particular inter-party fights. It gets very complicated very quickly. And com this kind of complexity means that you're not necessarily sure who to negotiate with. Just because someone is called the foreign minister of a country doesn't mean they have any treaty-making ability whatsoever. Like, it might exist de jure, but does it exist de facto? So because of this, if you have many client states, sooner or later, you will want to make their political system compatible with your own so that their elites are weaker and easily comprehensible and legible to the elites of your country. In many ways, for example, Athens did something very similar, right? Or Rome did stuff that was very similar. Even, you know, arguably, you know, the, the, um, the failure to assimilate local elites into their own value system might have been one of the driving forces of colonialism. What is the common framework of relationship between, say, you know, an upper middle class Englishman and a Hindu prince? Possibly there isn't any, so maybe you need to remove the Hindu prince and install the Englishman as a governor, right? Mm. Uh, I am conscious of time, so we're going to have one final question from us. Uh, lots of other subjects we could talk about. Long history, uh, technology, China. Hopefully we'll get to some of that in the Q&A. A more practical question for you, Samo. Um, you've written a lot about the need to find exceptional thinkers and to learn from them. Uh, so you had an essay on this, which is on your website, called the uh, How to Find the Frontier of Knowledge. And you've put this in practice yourself. You've talked to Slavoj Žižek, Peter Thiel, David Deutsch, uh, Tyler Cowen, uh, others uh, that I'm not mentioning. Uh, I'm interested to hear what kind of value this has provided for you. And how do you reach out to thinkers like that? How do you establish those kinds of relationships? Well, unsurprisingly, because I believe in intellectual dark matter, I think almost anyone that's very intellectually generative uh, will have things that are difficult to put into words or possibly don't travel well. An in-person conversation, especially a physically in-person conversation, and ideally an extended correspondence over time, can reveal many very, very productive subtleties to it. So they might have special pieces of knowledge that they can share. You might observe something in how they think or approach questions. Like after you've talked to someone many, many times over, uh, it's easy to recognize a Zizekian answer or a Telian insight, right? Something that really fits the thinking style of that person. In a way, if that gets good enough, you've essentially been informally apprenticed by that thinker. I actually think that some of the greatest thinkers in history were people who went out of their way to apprentice themselves to other exceptional thinkers, right? So you might, 
if you want to be a fields medalist, one of the best things you can do is like show up at a fields medalist's door and say that, you know, I just want to learn from you. Let me help any way I can. I just want to work on math with you. How can I make this viable? Right? The numbers actually, when you look at the intellectual lineages, they back it up. Like the best way to, you know, be an exceptional mathematician is to be taught by an exceptional mathematician. This doesn't guarantee it. It biases the odds. Secondly, it's always good to correct your perspective and you never can be an expert. Uh, you never can be an expert in everything, but many things matter for active decision making. So why would you why would you settle for less? Why would you go to the source? Why would you go to the photocopy of the photocopy of the photocopy rather than just go read the original? And if you apply this logic to originality and if your uh, model of the into the political economy of intellectuals is that there's a small number of generative thinkers who sort of emanate outwards, well, go to the source. That's the best possible place. You'll be greatly advantaged. Um, so that's, that's the reasoning why. You want to inherit their tradition of knowledge as much as possible, and you want them to correct your opinion on object-level topics, and you want to offer value yourself, hopefully helping them uh, in their service to society, because whether or not they want to serve society, they are serving society. The positive externalities are absolutely massive, right? Like I wrote recently an article for Palladium magazine on how I think that Confucius and Lao Tzu and so on are possibly responsible for some of the unique positive features of Chinese civilization, right? Uh, I think that's you know, even if they did not intend it, as long as they were active and as long as they were assisted, the positive externalities are there. So how to, how to approach them probably, right? That, that would be the part of the question I haven't yet answered. Um, well, I think surprisingly often, an insightful cold email helps, though it has to be brief. Even more often, an endorsement by people whose opinion they respect. This kind of endorsement can get you a proper meeting. Um, the endorsement can come either on intellectual grounds or if you have some economic or other value you can provide, right? So you kind of have to be, you have to make yourself the right kind of person. And you have to talk to the people right next to the exceptional individuals. And uh, eventually, you know, good opportunities arise and good reasons to talk to them. It's very, I'll actually say it's very easy to talk to some of the most prominent people in the world. It's much more difficult having something worth saying. Yeah, I think that's a useful note then to end our first portion on. Wolf, do you want to take this to the Q&A? Sure. Um, Michael asks, are you strictly agnostic on the question of the origin of great founders, or do you have a view of how they're produced? Uh, to what extent have any past societies figured out better how to produce great founders? Um, for for example, via training programs or, or uh, bomb projects, succession succession efforts are any societies or individual cases very interesting on this topic in terms of training uh, more great founders well uh, the tyke bomb right is a fun concept it's a concept of oh. a kid that is trained from childhood from birth for a specific purpose there are right. a few of those right like montagna is arguably such a such a person like of the of the essays right the creator of this modern concept of an essay he was raised from childhood by caretakers who only spoke classical latin and greek to him like that's like a really extreme approach banning from like your child's ears any sort of like profane language only having them master these languages educating them and so on a different example is john stuart mill who was like basically educated to be a replacement for i think bentham i think bentham was the intellectual they were trying to replace uh, sometimes this stuff works. I'm always like, I don't think it can reliably work. I think we don't necessarily see the failed tech bombs. I think training programs like, you know, the more specialized and rigorous it is, so rigorous in a bureaucratic sense, the narrower it is, the more it's an assembly line. And the more it is a set of challenges, like the Corsus Honorum, in ancient Rome, right, where you had a number of posts that were different in nature, possibly like a general, a provincial governor, someone who's essentially dealing with law, someone who's dealing with logistics. You had to succeed at each of these posts to eventually make it to consul as the crowning achievement. When the Corsus Honorum was least standardized, it worked the best. And by the time where people aspired to complete the Corsus Honorum, at that point it was dead. 
right? There was this joke at the time of Augustus and later on where people were made consuls for a period of 30 days just so they could say that they went through the courses honorum and that they were made a man in that year and that they were a consul. consul. Like that's such a decayed version of it. And of course, by that point, it's the period of empire, right? The Republic is long over. So, um, you know, this is why I think that, you know, if I wanted to learn and, and educate and like, you know, connect to uh, others who want to feel a responsibility for uh, American society, the Harvard of 1900 might not have been a bad choice at all. It's just that these things change over time, right? So I think the training programs for exceptional individuals are very specific. They cannot be bureaucratically administered for long. Uh, they often require direct contact with exceptional people. So I think that one of the key reasons is now, you know, the parents of Montagne and uh, John Stuart Mill were not themselves exceptional individuals. They were decently competent individuals that were, however, inspired by other exceptional individuals or put them in touch, um, you know, their children with those individuals. But um, I think you have to make it worthwhile, right? If you have a society where it's possible to invest in an intellectual successor, that's a that's a society that will have more great founders, right? And when I say intellectual, let me make it very, very clear. I consider Alexander the Great an intellectual successor to Aristotle because I think the barrier between thought and action is uh, in the best of us, the best humans, very porous both ways, right? It's actually a, a, a failure to think of thought as something that is stuck on paper, is never enacted in physical reality. So Jeff has um, a question that kind of fits as a follow-up pretty well here. What are the most useful things individual people can do in the context of a declining civilization? Maybe if they believe themselves to be living in a declining civilization to overcome that decline. You kind of touched on this in your article uh, recently. I think that, uh, you know, that the article on uh, how Li Zhao China reverse engineered civilization is a pretty good approach. I think the most remarkable thing about Li Zhao China is that they realized they were in decline, right? The default answer is you're not in decline. So I would say approach your society's claims of victory with some minor skepticism, not with a desire to see it fail, okay? So don't be blind contrarian. Examine the facts of the matter. Try to figure out whether it is or is not in decline. Then I really do recommend that if your, your belief it's, it's in decline, try to do an analysis of what's the actual thing that's going wrong. If possible, try to provide something no one else is providing, right? So if excessive bureaucratization, bureaucratization is an issue, uh, create essentially pockets of resources, both social and economic, where you don't need the usual credentials to have the otium, so like another Greek con Roman concept, leisure time, reflective time, training time uh, to to master some of the things, right? Because if it's only possible to, you know, master science in an academic environment and the academic environment itself is broken, then there won't be any scientific progress, right? You might try to reform, say, academia or reform the courses honorum, but that's a super difficult task to like reform the courses honorum in the early imperial context would mean like overthrowing uh, Augustus. Right? It would mean like changing the economic fundamentals of Rome so that the landowning class doesn't dominate. Like reform is more resource intensive than building something new, but you might be obliged to do reform if you are late in you know, a centralized declining empire where the society itself is fairly unified and fairly dysfunctional. Right? So if it's not disunified, dysfunctional, you have to actually go to the center and just reform things at the center. Uh, what you then need to do is bring fresh forces. So, you know, maybe I would very, very cautiously propose that, you know, a revolution, it's sort of like, you know, it's sort of like, uh, what do I compare it with? It's like sort of like the, the Heimlich maneuver, right? It's like a desperate last attempt to save a thing when it works. I don't think it's ever the, the normal best way to achieve progress. Right. And given what you were saying earlier, it sounds like you need to understand how the society you're living in is structured. You mentioned centralized or decentralized. Perhaps if, you know, if you study a person who responded in a, a society that was structured differently and you just take all their lessons to heart, but your context doesn't allow for the same things, you will end up failing. 
Well, of course, right? Like you can mm. you can imitate something that's completely ill suited to your circumstances. Um, mm. You know, arguably, you know, the brilliance of say the brilliance of someone like Napoleon at the end of the day was that he understood when the lessons from Alexander the Great apply and when they do not apply. Because, in fact, he understood quite well how, say, artillery changes things or how Paris and France are very, very different countries than uh, the Roman Empire was at the time of Caesar, right? The balance of power and everything is quite different. It can be very harmful to be confused as to, like, the nature of your society in this way, right? You might you might end up, in fact, producing like perverse results. It's easy to lose track of efforts to, well, okay, there are uncountable examples of attempts at serious reform that weakened countries, right? And weakened mm -hmm. civilizations. And again, I want to emphasize like, you know, when I say the center, I don't necessarily mean in government. You can have someone that is in the center of a civilization or the very sent heart of it but doesn't officially have a government position right mm -hmm. like the pope like, in the declining roman empire perhaps. exactly right one, yeah. one way we could think about the papacy is that the papacy preserved itself and preserved the catholic church the roman state religion past the decline of the roman empire so maybe the brilliance of the church was not being taken down with the empire mm -hmm. right so that's also a viable thing but in that case like you have to think well I was create, you know, my institution was created in symbiosis with this thing. Can there be a church after the empire? That was profoundly unclear. You know, again, mm -hmm. there's no large organized Zoroastrian religion after the fall of the Persian dynasties, right? After their conquest. Mm -hmm. If you were a Christian in the fourth century, you might not know that Christianity can outlast the empire, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. actually a significant achievement that it could. It means that you were uh, essentially over time producing a whole new civilization, right? And I think this reached fruition in the syn synthesis between the papacy and the Frankish uh, warlords, right? Like Charlemagne sponsors the study of Latin and a revival of Latin law. However, this Latin law is applied in a context where it's essentially this tribal feudal-ish society, this tribal society translating into a feudal society. So completely different from like Republican Rome, right? Mm -hmm. Or like the early kingdom of Rome. So even though the law might be super similar, the application is so different that it's this act of, okay, an act of civilizational re-engineering necessarily always is an act of civilizational creation because so much of the intellectual dark matter has to be reinvented so it can be implemented differently, right? Mm -hmm. It's like finding a chassis of a car you're not obliged to like put an uh, uh, electric motor in. You might, in fact, put into the same chassis like an internal combustion engine. It might work better. Or if you're like really, really unlucky, you might just put a horse in front and like call it a carriage. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have another question from Jeremy Real who asks, who are some of the historical examples of individuals who have performed these repair or rebuilding functions other than, say, Charlemagne? Well, uh, here's an interesting argument. I think uh, Alexander the Great was such a person because usually mm -hmm. we consider him as the person that ended the city-state and created the Greek Hellenistic empires, right? The Greek kingdoms that succeeded it, possibly even a template for the Roman Empire. Let's remember, uh, you know, much as Napoleon admired Caesar and Alexander, Caesar himself, his contemporary Pompey, they admired deeply Alexander the Great, the classical anecdote of the 30-year-old Caesar crying, weeping in front of the statue of Alexander, bemoaning what all Alexander has achieved, and well, Caesar has done so little, right? Like, mm -hmm. that right there, right, is learning by imitation and example, right? So uh, I do think that there's something that can be transferred between great founders, and a society that's aware of great founders will tend to produce more of them, if only through imitation and attempt. Noting, of course, that Pompey fails, right? And Crassus right. fails. It's Caesar that succeeds. So the attrition rates, keep those in mind, right? You might think you're Caesar, you're probably, you're much likely to be Pompey or, or Crassus. Uh, but to, to actually answer the heart of your question, I think that, uh, or rather the, not your question, the, the audience's question, uh, I forget who asked it, the Alexander the Great produced a new form of Greek state. Uh, it's my belief that even though we don't have much of written from Aristotle, Aristotle was an astute enough observer of humanity to realize that the city-states of Greece were in his era quite dysfunctional. He, after all, had 
unfavorable run-ins with the Athenian government. There's a reason, you know, he ended up being the tutor of Alexander the Great in this court in Macedonia, which was at the time considered half barbarous, right? It was considered barely Greek. The sort of like these people who just live so differently and are like, you know, focused on horsemanship, like horsemanship of all things, really? More so than ships, right? That's good to remember. Um, so I think that Alexander the Great qualifies. He found a new formula for Greek society to operate politically. It preserved and even flour caused a flourishing of Greek technology over time. The aqueduct is not a Roman invention. It's an invention of these Greek kingdoms, right? That preceded Alexander's conquest. They were all over Asia Minor, Central Asia. It's good to remember every place we might today think of as Islamic was essentially Greek speaking in this period as a consequence of Alexander's conquest. There were Greek cities and Greek citizens, you know, Greek speakers in modern day Afghanistan, right? Or there was a Greek kingdom all the way in India. Uh, and this, you know, this definitely shaped future society. So I won't go into as much depth for other refounders, but I will say Confucius. Um, you know, I think Charlemagne's more like the creation of a new one rather than reform, but I think Confucius counts as reform. Um, I would say Alexander the Great would, as I stated. I think that there's a strong, strong argument to be made that Augustus is also such a, such a figure. Once the Republic is no longer viable, you can maintain some of the features of the Republic, but fundamentally you need to build something new, right? You need to build like a new type of political system and machine that can work. And not only a new type of political system, arguably a whole different system of public religion. Religion in the Roman context was not separated from the state. Arguably, uh, Constantine uh, the Great is another such example with the integration of Christianity. Um, there are some more interesting examples of like people who would be seen more as reformers than founders. Uh, there's a strong argument to be made that, you know, assuming America is a world historically important society, civilization, or fragment of Western civilization, I think an argument easy to make just on the basis of its 20th century track record. I think Lincoln is straightforwardly a reformer and possibly single-handedly shapes it more than uh, most other founding fathers, right? Like if you, you know, and he, even that I can say most other founding fathers, even though he's 60 years later, and that that intuitively makes sense is testament to what a big reforming figure he is, for worse or better. Uh, unsurprisingly, I also think Bismarck, you know, created the modern nation state proper. So I think uh, Bismarck also counts as a reformer in this sense. Yeah, that's a very good list. I On your earlier point about the Islamic world, I think there's often too little consciousness in the West that a lot of, well, several at least Islamic empires, but especially the Ottoman, mm -hmm. explicitly considered themselves successors to the Roman Empire. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting to look at when these re-founders or conquerors come about, who they themselves are taking as their own inspiration. I do want to get to Siavash's question, which has been pretty popular, it looks like, with the listeners. And Siavash asks, what are some object objective metrics that can be used to evaluate whether an institution or a civilization is declining? So he proposes perhaps net out migration or low savings rates. What mm. metrics do you use? Wow, that's an interesting question. I think most of the modern measures are in a way too attuned to a bureaucratic uh, framework that might not survive it, right? So what is net savings exactly if wealth is fleeing from monetary medium, right? Like you could imagine a world where people are trying to stash assets in land rather than uh, stuff that's denominatable in dollars or whatever. Uh, I also think that if you have a failing society, you know, you might have uh, incorrect numbers coming in or out. I think it's possible to establish a few things. Um, I think, for example, in the late Roman period, you had a decline in atmospheric lead pollution. This isn't because the Romans invented green technology. It's because they were mining much less. How do we know what's the content of atmospheric lead? We know because of the Greenlandic ice samples, right? The ice in Greenland, as it layers up, the small bubbles trap basically atmosphere samples. Today, when uh, we drill down into the ice, we can retrieve core samples and analyze the ice at different layers. There are all sorts of other physical measurements of byproducts we could use. Things like how, you know, how uh, much of the desert was irrigated. That's like basically something you can just establish through material measures. 
I also think that it's uh, relatively more difficult but viable to track population size. I think almost always a society with declining population sizes is a declining society. Something has just deeply gone wrong if uh, human beings are failing to replace themselves. I'm not even saying they should replace themselves. I'm just saying that if you were looking at an animal and uh, the animal stops breeding in captivity, it's clearly because of some difference between captivity and like, you know, it's wild environment. So I think perhaps right now we have accidentally put ourselves in captivity because uh, almost all advanced industrial societies have this, uh, this failure mode. I think though more than like low fertility, I'm thinking here, sudden population crashes when societal infrastructure fails. Key examples of this would be the aftermath of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, popularly known as the Three Kingdoms period in China, has a drop in population over the period of 60 years that is, I think, a two-thirds population drop. That didn't happen through low fertility, okay? That happened through starvation, probably. Some of it may be through disease and some of it through just direct killing. While the period, the Three Kingdom period is romanticized, that's a catastrophic drop in population size and arguably a catastrophic drop in, in societal complexity. There is a non-linear relationship between population size and complexity. Um, also, I think that the late Bronze Age collapse is another great example where you just see a massive population decline. So you can have material measures that track various kinds of production, production going down. You can have population drops, which can be figured out through things like, you know, examining how many people are in the cities, whether cities are being abandoned or not, or just by like looking at their official figures, such as censuses, assuming the censuses are accurate. And finally, uh, basically the loss of key indicating technologies, like what's the most fragile technology you can think of? It's a little bit like a canary in the coal mine, right? You might see as toys, not as methods of production, but as toys, steam engines in Alexandria at its peak. You won't see toy steam engines in Alexandria when it's declined. Likewise, you might see as arguably very expensive physics toys, the Large Hadron Collider today. But if these colliders were no longer built, while the justification for their building remains, like something has gone wrong, something has gone a little bit off. Like we should be suspicious of things such as like, you know, well, the ancients were, uh, you know, they were less, they were less, uh, they were less, uh, we, we are so rich now. We are so much richer than we were 50 years ago that we can't possibly afford something as expensive as the Apollo missions. There should be something weird there. That's a little bit of a contradiction, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and it also seems to be the case that we could assume that um, every change from a civilizational decline is experienced as something harmful or negative. But, you know, well, if we think of say, in, in, they're not they're not completely sure. Like if you saw several of these, you could be quite sure it's a it's a yeah. decline. Well, but I, I'm all I'm even thinking of, of, of things like uh, and I'm kind of taking here from your statement about looking at lead levels. You know, is it we, we today would think of this as a good thing, but it's probably a sign of decline. I'm also thinking here of when, uh, you know, urban dwellers in the late Western Roman Empire were abandoning the cities to live in monastic communities, for example, they themselves um, experienced that probably as an improvement in their own lives. But we know that in looking at it from the broad social level, it ended up being uh, a, a decline, you know, or you could even look at how a surplus, which is no longer reinvested in productive activity in civilization might sometimes get spent on uh, gargantuan monuments, which we think of as wonders of the world, but in those societies perhaps were signs that they could no longer be productive in other ways. So, uh, you know, I, I think you're making an, an excellent point here where we sometimes, we only know in the historical hindsight that something was actually a sign of decline. Well, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult again, but I think in general, societal capacity, you know it when you see it, mm -hmm. right? Like in, in something like um, intellectual creativity or flourishing or the creation of new, entirely new traditions of knowledge, that's something that's way trickier to establish, right? Uh, because there, you know, the material in question is less preserved, right? For all we know, we have the intellectual history of the Roman Empire completely wrong. It's all a matter of these sort of uh, 
obscure effects where we see certain pieces of literature and we don't see other pieces of literature, right? It might be either mm-hmm. censored because of like, you know, religious or political frictions, or it might just be lost due to happenstance. So the intellectual imprint is always weaker. But if you have a good intellectual imprint, if you're certain of it, uh, I would add this as a fourth indicator, right? Like lack of any sort of intellectual production. And then, you know, finally, I'm going to say, I know of no great society without exceptional people. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, Matt asks a question, which, um, so this takes us more to Silicon Valley. Uh, one common view in Silicon Valley is that technology lets us escape and route around politics. You know, you can decentralize your way out of DC or something like that. Um, you wrote at Palladium recently, uh, that material technology is often downstream of social technology, uh, the institutions that exist. So given that, how should people in tech be thinking about politics and about social technology? Um... I was uh, typing a brief answer to one of the questions in text. I'm sorry, the the chat is so active and like such such good ideas flowing yes. around in it. I was it's distracted our excellent audience. It. Yes, yes. Um, hopefully, after after the session, I'll get to chat to some of them directly. Um, mm-hmm. The the question was for the Palladium audience, correct? Did I hear this? Yes. So so Matt is asking, uh, given that material mm-hmm. technologies are downstream of social technologies, you wrote about this recently at Palladium, mm-hmm. uh, how should people in tech be thinking about politics? And this kind of in light right. of the fact that there's this prevalent view that you can just maybe decentralize your way or use tech to escape social and yeah. political questions. Well, well, let's put it this way. Every technology exists in a social context. By producing something intensely technological, you are always, without exception, producing something intensely social. I think by making something that's more powerful technologically, that replaces a previous piece of perhaps intangible social technology, you are always making yourself more the center of attention and more a power player, not less. So the idea of exit through technological progress seems the ideal of the absentee landlord. I think it's much better to like just think of it as like, well, you know, if I am building new technology, if I'm replacing social systems, then it befalls me or befalls people like me to steward society. And in a way, if you look at, say, coverage of of Zuckerberg, the coverage is split. It's outrage that Facebook is doing such, you know, like censorship and privacy violations. And on the other hand, people are outraged that they're not like using their powers to mold the election and mold public discourse. In a way, I would almost say that the second complaint is more real. Facebook has become extremely powerful, and we are upset that Facebook, or rather Zuckerberg, is not ruling us. Right? We're, we're upset that they're not thinking about society. So I think that my formulation would be technologists that strive to remain ignorant of politics and society will ac- encounter ever worse pushback as they try to innovate. And founders, technologists that keep society in mind, and accept both responsibility and limits, but also accept the reality of their personal power, will be able to innovate without limit. And I would argue that Bezos is very good at thinking about politics. Now, we might not agree with the direction of his politics or whatever, or we might agree that doesn't really matter. What matters is that he is not disliked in the same way because he clearly does engage with the power structure, right? Like he doesn't doesn't have the illusion that he's outside of society. He's not anti-social quite in that way. Mm-hmm. And so perhaps he gets more goodwill from the people that do approve of his actions. Somewhat, yeah. And like, mm-hmm. let's remember that um, you know the the technological innovation. It's like you know, it's. Uh, I think that perhaps their desire for decentralization is coming from the very real feeling that technology is being choked off, and I think that's that's happening. I think Silicon Valley is no longer the center of innovation. I think that has moved to China, but I think China is much less productive than Silicon Valley was at the peak of its productivity. So I think the desire for decentralization, I can empathize with it. I think it's a, a desire to alleviate the symptoms, right, hmm. of, uh, of malaise. Do you think, you know, looking at people like Zuckerberg and Bezos, they've built these companies that we can tell, and I think they obviously also have realized, uh, as you're saying about Jeff Bezos at least, that they built social technologies. Um, 
to what degree is it possible to build something thinking it's just, you know, a, a material technology and end up with something that's a powerful social technology? Do you have to actually be aware that you're building a social technological institution or can you do it by accident, so to speak? Well, you don't have to think of it as a social technological institution, right? You just okay. have to think of it as changing human behavior or like believing it'll change human behavior. And certainly there is found innovation. It's just that the most potent things historically have many moving parts. Like let's consider when America's founding fathers are setting up the constitution, how many moving parts are there in that design? That's like way too many to be unaware of what you're doing. And when it comes to a significant reform of the church or whatever, or when it comes to like, you know, um, Rockefeller's innovations in the industrial sector, right? Like there's too, there are too many interlocking parts, right? I think there are a few cases where this like very naive discovery of something might result in massive changes. But again, I think it's usually something that uh, takes into account many, many different factors. Hopefully that, that answers the question, but feel free to rephrase it again if, uh, if it didn't quite answer it. No, I, I think that was a, a fleshed out answer. Uh, Wolf, do you want to grab another question? Sure. So, so Juan Manuel Segura, excuse me if I pronounced that wrong, asks, does society have to have its own consistent theory of history for, uh, for great founder theory or, or for, for great founders to, to uh, work on that society? Or does it work when society has kind of lost its identity and doesn't know how to think about history and how to think about itself? Um, do, do, can, how, do, how do great founders react to, say, uh, a situation where there's a whole host of theories of history competing for prominence? I think that's a great time. I think it's, it can be a wonderful time of ideological competition. Though this is like a relatively fragmented society again, right? Because uh, the again, the classic example might be uh, the Hungred Schools period in Chinese history, or it might be the 19th century in European history, or possibly the 20th century. You can have a period of intense ideological competition with their radically different theories of history motivating very different factions resting on very different stacks of social technology, right? The theory of history of the Mohists is as distinct from the theory of history of the legalists as the theory of like, you know, the Soviet Union is from the theory of the United States during the Cold War, right? Or even more so, right? Possibly more like, you know, Nazi Germany versus Soviet Union. Um, the, the views here are very much, very much ideally they should be evidence-based. So if you see low belief, low understanding, low action at this relatively ambitious scale versus a lot of activity on rapidly changing ideas, these are two different environments. One of those is an intellectually relatively dead environment. The other one is an intellectually very generative environment, right? You might have a lack of coherence because of overabundance of thinking on how history is happening or because of just a death of awareness where this kind of old ideology has been eroded away, right? These old understandings and beliefs have been eroded away almost into nothing, yet n nothing is happening, almost like a kind of heat death situation. So I think the heat death situation is actually like super unstable and very artificial. You can imagine it towards the end of a particularly dysfunctional Egyptian dynasty, right? Uh, or you can imagine it at the end of a particularly dysfunctional Chinese dynasty. Uh, but it feels like it's very fragile because there's always an outside world. And the outside world has, you know, again, individuals that uh, are motivated and other bases of power and infrastructure that might overcome your very, very stagnant society. But I do think that I, just, just to, to try to get to the crux of it, I think, I think uh, Great Founder Theory holds whether or not people believe in it. In fact, it's kind of interesting, right? Because almost any social theory you might believe will change the function of society if it's believed at scale. But in a way, great founder theory is somewhat invariant. If people think it's true, it's only even more true, right? <laughs> and if people yeah. don't believe it's true, it's still kind of true, actually. <laughs> but if acted on, can, can a society structure itself in such a way as to create more great founders? 
I think they can. Yeah, I think they yeah. can. But so I think it's a, not. It's not going to be a big aware effort. It's going to be like a very narrow institutional effort for human excellence, right? So you're right. going to have like you a have partial to act on the theory in a way exactly. to, to build the institutions. Exactly. Do, do you think that there is, um, you know, I, I I think of what you were saying where. If you live in a society where, uh, like in in the late Shao Dynasty, there there had been this intellectual drying up uh, of awareness within the power structures themselves, and so right. we get the hundred schools. Do found do you think that founders kind of you know water travels to the lowest place? Uh, if there is an area in society where there has been a significant amount of decay, is that a place where we might ex? like expect to see either if not more great founders at least more people trying to be great founders disrupting something that seems ossified or mm -hmm. you know how, how do you think about this i think that the most important thing often is that there is a resource base that the founders can command right so if the circumstances are too um too challenging then the the difficulty is higher then probabilistic, you, you just expect fewer of them, right? This is what I mean by stochastic, right? Uh, it might be that an individual in a very tranquil society can change everything, but the individual might be very unlikely. It's very unlikely that they arise, right? That they happen. Um, I don't quite know how to predict the probabilities of such individuals. I think that would be an extremely interesting research project, probably best left for the next civilization. I think we're, we're probably not gonna make, uh, have the ability to crack that one. Um, but the socio-emotional learning or the acquiring both the right type of information and retaining the ability to act on that information, this is, seems to be exceedingly hard for human beings, right? Like we seem to, we seem to very easily, uh, slip out of it or fall out of it or go into, let's call it, a lower energy or more st stable state. Like in a way, you could think of it as live versus dead players. I think live players can go dead, and dead players very infrequently go live. I, I think this is almost an anthropological claim. People burn out way more than they are inspired or transformed. For every time, you know, like, you know, Jean d'Arc receives a revelation from God, about 10 or 15 people of zeal like lose belief in life or lose belief in their ability to shape the world through knowledge maybe maybe a thousand maybe a thousand is the actually right ratio i don't know it's just it's it's lopsided wolf uh you had a question you wanted to bring up here yeah so this is kind of pulling together a bunch of different threads here about revolution about theories of history um and about about founding sort of the great archetypal mythologies that we have in society so there's sort of this moment the myths are when, just distributed information honestly really. right and yeah. <laughs> and there's there's this moment you know after a revolution or or after some large institutional change or with the founding of some new dominant institution where the mythology of that um it, it sort of becomes society's new framework for uh for interpreting things it, like these large institutions often carry along with them an ideology um and and this relates also to kind of what we were talking about with russia reinterpreting its history to integrate all these different things um i would just be curious to hear you talk more about how great founders through their efforts can plan and and take into account this these sort of longer term effects of the grand mythological narratives that they end up founding and how much this kind of uh these are themselves uh, institutions in a way that that end up shaping subsequent civilization the founding historical events right the reality of history or the irreality of history it's it's this deep spectrum where different civilizations have fallen on different ends of it if we think about it in one way there are kind of only two societies that have really maybe three that have really embarked on rigorous historical analysis in the way we would understand it so you could say that you know china of a certain time period with the records of the grand historian greece with you know paragons like thucydides and early modern Europe. 
Uh, I would actually argue that right now we are transitioning from a society with a strong awareness of the past and the physical realities of the past towards a society with low awareness of the physical reality of the past. So I think we're actually transitioning out of a society that's capable of having like long-term reflective historic memory like early modern Europe, uh, Greece, and China. This doesn't, however, mean we lose all track of it. Again, the mythological component is another way to refactor history. You might not remember the particular lawgiver, but you might remember a particular story about Zeus, right? You might confabulate it or create it, right? Um, and that type of memory can also be very potent, arguably can last for a very long time. There have been some claims with analysis of... Uh, um, with analysis of language and analysis of folk tales, that there are folk tales that have stayed basically unchanged for about 10 or 12,000 years. Uh, the arguments on that are interesting. People can Google that if they want. Uh, one, one has to be careful with them, right? Linguistic analysis, right? It's, it's always very tricky. Um, and the question is how much one should believe the theories of linguists. Well, see, that's, that's failure to transmit knowledge right there in my phone. <laughs> started going yeah my, my phone started speaking you know this is this is the future our computers are ruling us or something i don't know i don't actually mm -hmm. think that's the future but before i was interrupted my point being historical memory is an intentional choice and requires a certain type of apparatus in society to even access so direct material facts of the past mythological memory is usually available though even myths can be subsumed and destroyed with explicit ideology, right? Because let's remember, like, what, you know, the term pagan, right? What does pagan actually mean, right? It means, like, you know, rural, right? It means backwater. Yeah, the country people. The country Six, people, seven. you know, keep on sacrificing stuff and, like, you know, leaving beads and flowers next to the streams, even though we tell them good Christians don't do this. And a few centuries mm -hmm. later, well, the country people like keep giving beads and flowers to saints in the river, even though we tell them no good Protestant dude does this. And today we might be like, you know, and again, the country people keep, you know, having these like little superstitions, even though they're not scientific. Well, it's, it's this kind of memory that's possibly emotional, it's cached, it needs interpretation. Uh, you can have more or less sensitivity to mythological traditions as well. And you can have more or less ability to reason about your environment. So um, I would say that the historical civilizations that track material history will communicate to each other through the depths of time. I think, you know, hmm. something like the pyramids continues to shape history to this day. I think were the pyramids not constructed, 19th century British imperialists and you know 17th century ottoman imperialists and 10th century arab rulers would have been rest, less reflective on the transience of empire so the british empire was keenly aware of its own mortality and otherwise might have been blissfully unaware maybe well okay the pyramids aren't enough maybe the romans need not have left ruins of a certain type but i think there's this fact that for societies that do rely on historic memory these large material artifacts but also the trajectory of past societies are very important facts about the world that shape their beliefs, right? Again, remember Napoleon, right? Why in the world is there a causal chain from Alexander the Great to Napoleon? It's only because of historic memory. Hmm. So Samo, I assume you're working on how to transmit, transmit uh, great founder theory to the next civilization. I mean, obviously, right? We're, we're still working on the pyramid. It's like being constructed. It's like this nice ziggurat style structure. I think you guys mm. might, might give us some advice on that. <laughs> if they wall off we'll, part of the Bay Area, guys, now you know why. Yeah, we'll figure it out soon. Um, okay, well, that, we're just about out of time for the recorded section. Uh, Samo, thank you so much for coming on. This was a very interesting discussion. We're definitely looking forward to having more of your work at Palladium. You can, fi you can follow Samo on Twitter at Samo Buria. He archives all his writing and talks at samoboria.com. Thanks to the audience for the great questions. Special thanks to all our Palladium members for coming out and supporting us. To become a member and get invited to up upcoming salons, please visit us at palladiummag.com slash subscribe. And remember to subscribe to Palladium Magazine on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at Palladium Mag. So thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you for having me on the show. It was a delight. <laughs>